The arguments for the pre-tribulational rapture. This may take a, a good while, but we're in no rush, and uh, we'll, we'll just get through this. Here we go. Number one, the natural chronological reading of 1 Thessalonians 4:13 through 5:11 presents the rapture before the day of the Lord. Uh, I'll show you the verse, but basically what it's saying here is uh, most of your other views put the day of the Lord on the same moment uh, of the return of Jesus, as he shows up, and that is the day of the Lord. But when you look at the, the chronological reading here, let me see if I can get here. Here we go. Uh, look at this. You have in verse 17 of chapter 4, that we who are still alive, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. When you read onward into chapter 5, you get into this, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Um, the day of the Lord is the day of the judgment of God on the earth. It's the day of Christ returning to judge the earth. And so that natural reading puts a rapture before the day of the Lord, where your post-tribulation view or your amillennial view, I'm sorry, your post-millennial view, your amillennial view, they really do put the day of the Lord on the same moment as the return of Christ. Uh, and the rapture, they would say, is that return of Christ. There is no pre uh, tribulation rapture, but when Jesus comes a second time, that's it. So that's one little argument there. Here's number two. First uh, Thessalonians 5 verse 9 teaches that believers are not destined for wrath. Some might say that this refers to the wrath of hell and external or eternal judgment. However, the context of that promise is the wrath of the day of the Lord. And so we are not destined for uh, going through that sort of thing. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5.9, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to think that we might go through this wrathful tribulation just, to, just seems out of line with that passage. Uh, this is the one that you've mentioned before, Sig, and Manny and others have mentioned this passage. The restrainer of sin, who is taken out in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, and 7, is best understood as referring to the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit as embodied in his presence in the church. And so to have the church removed or have the Holy Spirit removed would be to remove also the church. And so you see this briefly in this verse, um, and you know what currently restrains him, speaking of the Antichrist there in verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians 2, so that he will be revealed in his time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. So what's keeping the evil antichrist from coming to the to power and taking over is the restrainer is, is keeping that. The Holy Spirit is the interpreted belief. And many uh, equate the Holy Spirit's presence in the world with the church, the work of the church. I think that is a beautiful view. Uh, this is, uh, in my view, the strongest uh, rapture defense in all of scripture revelation 3:10. i think this is the strongest passage the one that to me uh, gives very very good credence to the the view of the rapture revelation 3:10 promises that the church will be kept from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world and the more you study this one look at this verse because you have kept my command to endure i will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. You have this whole global testing that sounds like the tribulation, which you read in Revelation, but he's speaking of removing the church from that hour of testing. I think that's a very, very strong, my study, that is the strongest passage in all of scripture, defending a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Uh, here's number five, Israel, the people with whom God made an eternal covenant becomes prominent and the focal point of much that occurs at the end of the age. When you study Romans 11 and Revelation 7 especially, you see this grand focus on Israel, and the church, in contrast and by contrast, appears diminished or, or completely absent. And so when you study most of your end times passages uh, that, that, you know, or that show up after much mention of the church, whenever Israel is mentioned, the church is greatly diminished where most believe the church is completely absent. God has removed the church out of the world, and now he's dealing and blessing and using Israel at the end times. Here's number six. This is another argument I love, the doctrine of imminency, that Jesus could return at any moment, is the crucial and decisive argument, and the pre-tribulational rapture view is the best doctrinal position 
to maintain eminency. Uh, you, you have to agree that no matter what your view of the end times, you have to agree that the Bible tells us we must be prepared and ready for the return of Jesus. And we have to be ready at any moment. You know, he can come like a thief in the night. And so the rapture view holds that in really well. So I'm getting a, let me go here. All right, number seven, to argue against the uh, post-tribulation rapture, that the rapture would come after the tribulation, why would believers be taken up in the air after the tribulation only to do an immediate U-turn and immediately come back down to the earth? Now think about this. Uh, the post-tribulational rapture view says that when Christ returns, that's when he's going to call up the, the church up in the air. And then as he calls us up in the air, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And then we're going to come down with the Lord from the heavens uh, onto the earth. And it seems like an immediate U-turn. There, there's barely any time. There at least, it appears in Revelation 19, needs to be a little time for the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we all meet Jesus, and we have a great meal, and then we come down and, and judge uh, the armies of the earth. So it, it just seems a bit silly to just have us go up and come right back down, you know, instantly. Number eight, after Revelation chapter three, there is a noticeable absence of God addressing the churches. Matter of fact, you really don't see the church again until about Revelation 19. So from Revelation three, uh, all the way up to about 19, you do see people getting saved, but there's no explicit mention of the bride or the church. And it seems like the church is absent, where it's all this explanation of the rapture or, or the tribulation falling out from Revelation 4 all the way to about 17, 18. You see the tribulation, but there seems to be no mention of the church. You see it in the writings and the refrains that show up in John. In John's writing there, where he says, Let he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches in the first three chapters. That shifts to, Let him who has an ear to hear, listen. And so what's noticeably missing in that shift is the church. The, the church is no longer in that statement. And we know that the, you know, the church at that point appears to be removed. Here we go. Revelation 19 does not mention a rapture, even though that is where a post-tribulational rapture, if true, would logically occur. Thus, one can conclude that the rapture will have already occurred. That's an argument, by the way, from John MacArthur from his New Testament uh, commentary on uh, Thessalonians, where he has a whole list of arguments for a pre-tribulational rapture. That's one of his arguments. Number 10, the purity of the church is best maintained through a doctrine of eminency, best preserved the view of the rapture. I think we've, we've actually shared that one, but uh, we've shared the view of eminency. This uh, point, number 10 here is focusing on the word purity. The purity of the church is best maintained through a doctrine of eminency. So if we're to stay pure as believers, expecting he could return at any moment, uh, the best way purity can be maintained and preserved is through that imminent view of the rapture. That's kind of what we see in 1 John 3, where it says, Dear friends, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, he will, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So you have this purifying hope of, of having Jesus be revealed and return. And so if Jesus was to return right now, today, we would live a bit differently than if we thought he was going to return in a hundred years. We would not uh, goof around as much. We would be busy because we realize we could face him at any moment. And so number 11, God is a pattern in the Old Testament of delivering the righteous from destruction. Now, this is a pattern that you can study in the Old Testament where before destruction is poured out, God delivers the righteous. So some Old Testament examples of deliverance before judgment, you have Noah being delivered from the flood. You have Lot uh, being delivered uh, there. You have, um, let me see, you have the remnant of the Old Testament and you have Rahab. And so what I want to do is I want to read Genesis 18. 22 through 33 in Ezekiel 14. Do you, you know that story before Lot is, uh, before Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, you have Abraham having this conversation with God. And let's look at this right now. The men turned from there and they went towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And Abraham stepped forward and he said, will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? 
Now, this is a question Abraham's asking God, and I want you to think of this question in light of the tribulation. Do you really think God would let the church, the righteous, go through this tribulation period and be swept away with the wicked during the tribulation? And so he starts the discussion. What if there are 50 righteous people in, in Sodom? God, will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? You could not possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the, the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of all the earth do what is just? And so it's a question of, of the justice of God. And, and so the Lord speaks. He says, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham answered, since I have ventured to speak, Lord, even though I'm dust and ashes, suppose 50 righteous lack five. Subtract five from the number. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? God says, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And so they keep working down, right? Verse 29, then he spoke to him again, said, suppose 40 are found there. And he answered, I will not do it on account of 40. And he said, well, let the Lord not be angry. I'm, I will speak further. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30. All right, suppose there are 20. I will not destroy it on the count of 20. And he gives all the way down to 10. Lord, don't be angry. I will speak one more time. Suppose 10 are found there. And God answers, I will not destroy it on the count of 10. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he departed. And Abraham returned to his place. Now, a question that's asked is how low would God be willing to go? What if five were in the city? What if, what if one was in the city? What would God do? And I believe Ezekiel 14 actually picks up that picture of how low God might go to spare an entire city or to spare people that are in it. He's always going to spare the believer no matter what. Even if it's one, he will, he will save the believer even if the believer is swept up into death or destruction. But look at what he says in Ezekiel 14. Uh, destruction is coming onto Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, you have sword, famine, dangerous animals, and plague coming against Jerusalem. This is the end of uh, the Old Testament in a way where, where judgment through Babylon was showing up on Jerusalem. It's not the end of the Old Testament, but it's the end of Israel and, and Jerusalem. And so he says, I'm going to wipe out both man and animal from it. What's fascinating, by the way, in Ezekiel 14, the sword, the famine, the dangerous animals, and the plague correspond perfectly to the four horsemen of the apocalypse in revelation six so i highlighted that down there when you read about those those four horsemen of the apocalypse which we'll study much later you see the same approach there sword famine plague wild animals of the earth so there is i think a, a great connection of, of both passages and the, the question that's coming up in ezekiel is how many righteous are going to be there that maybe lord you wouldn't do such a thing and so as we go through ezekiel he basically says in ezekiel 14 verse 12 the word of the lord came to me son of man if a land sins against me by acting faithlessly and i stretch out my hand against it to cut off its supply of bread and to send famine through it and to wipe out both man and animal even if these three men noah daniel and job were in it they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness this is the declaration of the Lord. So God has taken it down to three people, three righteous people, and he's given them names, but these are names we all know of Old Testament saints, really, Noah, Daniel, and, and Job. And, and he says, even if three men were righteous men were in there, they would be delivered by the righteousness. It seems like the city would be destroyed, but they would be delivered. As you keep going, if I allow dangerous animals to pass through the land and, and depopulate it so it becomes desolate, with no one passing through it for fear of the animals. Even if these three men were in it, as I live, a declaration of the Lord, they could not deliver their sons and, or daughters, but they alone would be delivered. The land would be desolate. And you see it again. Even if I bring sword against the land, let a sword pass through it, so that I wipe out both man and animal from it. Even if these three men were in it, as I live, um, they could not deliver their sons or daughters, but they alone would be delivered. And so you see it over and over, uh, and then again in Ezekiel, uh, if I send plague, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So he goes through all four situations, and he says the, the righteous will be delivered. And so when you, when you look at the, the New Testament book of Revelation, it seems like that pattern would hold where God would deliver the righteous. And a pre-tribulation rapture makes sense in that theme that you see in scripture, especially in the Old Testament and, and in the New. 
And finally, just simply, there are just a few Old Testament examples of people being raptured. You have Enoch and Elijah being called up to heaven. You have Enoch walking with God, then he was not there because God took him. And you have Second Kings 2.11, they continued walking and talking in a chariot of fire with horses of fire. Um, suddenly appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind. So I believe that is it at this point. I'm going to uh, stop sharing at this point. Uh, let me see if I can do that. There we go. And we're going to open the floor for some questions, so you can unmute now, and we can talk about these things. Um, but hopefully, hopefully uh, everybody was able to survive. That looks like you all made it through that pretty good. Do we have any questions at all? Perfect. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'll send the notes again uh, this weekend. They, those will be have been posted. Um, I mean, for those of you, of course, that love the rapture, you're enjoying that, right? You're having a fun time, mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's awesome. Uh, I think you know the support is there. I, again, I will say it's not as doctrinally supported as the Trinity. Or as the uh, deity of Christ, we have, I think, hundreds of verses. But uh, when, you, when you take it all together, it seems like there's something there. Mike Schmidt, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, just the thought as you read the Ezekiel passage, and uh, thank you for doing that because I haven't been in Ezekiel for a while. Um, the sobering thought that our children, our grandchildren, our family members, they don't get to punch their ticket because we belong to the Lord. Uh, if the rapture does happen, uh, they don't come along unless they know the Lord. And that's, that's a pretty sobering thought. And I remember Job, how he would pray for his children that they might not sin against God. But, you know, obviously, I think he would pray for their relationship with them as well. Yeah, I mean, I but, think that... Go ahead, but, Tig. But the Holy Spirit will always be in the world to save those that want to be saved. So, so the people right after the rapture that say, oh my goodness, what happened? Oh, this is what my dad was talking about. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. They'll be saved. But they right. won't live through it, but they'll be saved. Yeah. I, I think though, Mike, I mean, for me, the thought of one of my sons, you know, waking up in a house where we've all been raptured and he's all alone, in a, in a world of, of tribulation, what a frightening thought. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a part of me as a dad, I would much rather endure the tribulation to try to help my son than, than uh, be raptured almost, you know, if I could. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I know that was a big motivator in the 70s in evangelism. It was, you know, there's no time to change your mind. The son has come and you've been left behind. You had children in the 70s and 80s watching uh, those early Christian films having rapture nightmares and at you know youth group <laughs> camps we would do pranks i did pranks when i was in high school where we we did rapture pranks we left you know clothes laying out in a cabin and somebody would would wake up late and realize oh no everyone's been raptured and, and uh, you know, do those sort of things. bible camp i remember those days yeah there's yeah, still time fun. for repentance pastor mm -hmm. amen <laughs> amen <laughs> My wife and I were talking about the film, A Thief in the Night, and I hope some of you have seen this film. The grand yeah. theme when the rapture happens is a man is mowing his yard, and the camera pans away, and you kind of hear this loud trumpet noise, and then the camera pans back, and the lawnmower is, is still running, but there's no one pushing it. And that was their grand <laughs> rapture moment, where it was like, ah, oh, the rapture has happened, the lawnmower is going. You know, anyways, it, it's silly. Uh, the film is silly, not the rapture. Um, so anyone else have any questions about the rapture or about uh, comments about, um, you know, anyone brave enough to push against any of that that was presented? <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. I'll, uh, I mean, I'm reading, I've been reading Revelation myself just to try to get a little bit stronger on eschatology. And where I get hung up is right about Revelation 7 where it talks about the, uh, the 144,000, which isn't the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, 144,000, but the 144,000 that are sealed. And then there's, there seems to indicate there's going to be a great multitude outside of that 144,000 
that's going to come out of the tribulation. And it says in, in 7, um, um, chapter 14, or actually 13, the one, the elders asked me, who are these people robed in white and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know, and then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Yeah. Like that tend to indicate that there will be some of the faithful that at least some of the faithful that go through this, this bad period. And it even calls the tribulation period out by name. In the yeah. Um, well, when you keep reading, of course, you'll see where those that come saved uh, become saved in the tribulation. It's a number that no man can count. It's so great a number that uh, I believe, Patrick, it will be the greatest revival in all of history will be during the tribulation. Oh, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, what, is, what was mentioned when the 144,000 were sealed, those are the Jewish people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're clearly Jewish. I mean, to name the tribes like they're naming them. That's why, uh, of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of, well, it's not really Jewish, Israel, the nation or the people, uh, they're scattered around the world and those 144,000 will be like the equivalent of Paul to really uh, evangelize the Israelites, the chosen people. We, 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 we always call it Jewish, but you know, there's more than one tribe. Uh, in, 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 it's, not just a, it's not just Judah or Jewish. There's also the other tribes. Yeah. And, and God promised to the uh, nation of Israel that those in the end times will be uh, will be saved. This is the time when the evangelization of the Jewish people will be, and that's where they, they're saying that whom they pierce when they see the Lord. But before that, the the, the uh, that's the time when those 144,000 were sealed. They're the one who will evangelize the rest of the Jewish people. Hey, Pastor. Oh, sorry, Israelite. We call it Jewish, but really it is the nation of Israel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Pastor. Yeah. Yeah, I, Mike. To Patrick's point, uh, and this, this is called a myriad, and it's the first time maybe in Revelation that you see this vast uncountable number of uh, redeemed people around the throne. And so if you hold that to be the rapture, the point of the rapture, and, and there's quite a few that do, it might advocate more for a mid-tribulation or those who you've been reading about the pre-wrath view, because you are partway through the tribulation at that point if you take the events in Revelation somewhat sequential. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, another uh, argument that, go ahead, Sig, before I, go ahead. Uh, I, my, my thing keeps going in and out, so I don't know what you discussed, but, um, but this great amount of people coming out of the tribulation doesn't say that they've washed their robes in the blood of the lamb, and they came out of this great tribulation. Uh, from what I understand, all believers, except the ones that are sealed, uh, will reject the number and they will be killed. Uh, virtually all believers in Christ are not going to live through the tribulation. And so that's, that's the crowd. Yeah, when you read Revelation 20, you have many that have been beheaded, you know, it says there. So I guess guillotines are making a comeback when you study the, the tribulation. Um, I think another argument, I, I was talking to other pastors this week, older gentlemen, just saying, hey, what, what are some things you like about a pre-tribulational rapture that, um, you know, that, that just 
you know, keep you excited, that make you want to hang on to that view. And, and they, uh, one of the guys said, listen, if you believe Jesus is going to come back after a antichrist appears, you really, you're not keeping an expectant hope towards your savior returning. You're replacing that with a depressing idea of this antichrist and you're looking for him rather than Jesus. And, and he just said, I like the positive view that Christ can come back at any moment. And, and I'm looking for him to return before that, you know, antichrist figure. And if I believed he would come um, after the antichrist, I'm going to, I'm not going to be looking for Jesus much anymore. Excited for Jesus. I'm going to be a little depressed looking for the, the gloom and doom guy, the Antichrist. So I thought that was just a simple uh, argument.